Hi, welcome. This is our third video of our series on the data loading tools. Today, we will go through the steps to map your own source and target data sets using the data loading workspace. If you haven't had a chance to view our previous videos, visit our GeoNet page for more resources and links. We will review the steps to prepare your own data loading workspace and how to map source fields to target fields, translate hard-coded values, and map coded value domains using expressions and lookup columns to improve the accuracy of your data loading. If you work for a water utility, most of these steps are also outlined in this story map for loading your organization's water system data into a utility network. While this story map demonstrates how to load your data from Esri's geometric network into the water distribution utility network, any other utility, including electric, wastewater, stormwater, gas, or telecommunications, can use these tools to migrate directly into a utility network from their own utility network data model. So the data loading tools are not limited to migrating utility data. Any organization can use these tools to load data from a source data model to a target data model. So before you begin working with the data loading tools toolbox, you need to make sure you meet the system requirements. So you will need ArcGIS Pro 2.4, or the most current version, and Microsoft Excel at least 2016. Also make sure you've cloned your Python environment and installed the latest version of the DLT Solutions Python package. For more details on how to do this, watch the video to set the stage for data loading. If you have multiple datasets that you need to load into a new dataset, you will start by creating a data loading workspace. You will create a set of workbooks that can be iterated as your process evolves. This allows you to have a record of your mapping information so that it can be fine-tuned and revisited as needed. In my current example, I will be loading data from a stormwater network data model into a geodatabase with Esri's stormwater utility network data model. I can use the Create Data Loading Workspace geoprocessing tool to map my source and target datasets and generate my data loading workspace. I will check the box for Calculate Feature Count Statistics. This will provide statistics for the source fields and help me better understand which of these fields need to be mapped and which ones have no values and don't require mapping. You will need to run this same tool using your own source and target data models to generate your own workspace. So for more details on how to do this, watch the video to set the stage for data loading. So I've already run the tool and generated my workspace, which now contains a series of Microsoft Excel workbooks for performing data loading. The majority of our mapping work will be done in the data reference and the data mapping workbooks. First, open the data reference workbook. This spreadsheet defines the data paths to your source dataset, target dataset, and data mapping workbooks. It also allows you to restrict the source data with a SQL query and to remove data in the output target database before appending and thus iterate through your data mapping process until perfected. First, I will only work on loading the stormwater inlets into the stormwater device layer. To do this, I will disable all the other mappings for now and set the enable column to false for all the other mappings. Enabling and disabling mapping for parts of your data loading while you sharpen your source to target mapping will save you time especially if you're loading a lot of data. In this way, you can decide to load only fragments of your data, and you can test parts of your mapping without performing a full data load every time. To selectively delete data from the target geodatabase before loading new data, you can write a SQL query in the target delete query column. Leave this blank to load new data without deleting the existing data. Since I will be iterating many times through the data loading process as I improve my mapping, I don't want to duplicate my data into the target geodatabase. 
So I will use a query 1 equal 1, which will delete all data found in the target before loading new data with transformation. By using the delete query and disabling all the other mapping workbooks, I can now focus on mapping segments of my data at a time and iterate through the process until I'm satisfied with the resulting transformed data. The source definition query column can be used to write SQL queries to select a subset of the source dataset being mapped to the target dataset. Now let's say I've just started to look through my data and I realize that I forgot to map a source for its target. So for example, I know now that all the inlet features from my source geodatabase, which have an inlet type value of open lid manhole, closed lid manhole, or catch basin, will need to be redirected into the structure junction target layer, while the rest of my inlets can be loaded into the stormwater device layer. At this point, depending on how much work you've put into your mapping, it may be worth simply rerunning the Create Data Loading Workspace geoprocessing tool with the new source and target and using that new workspace. Otherwise, you can also run the tool and copy the new generated workbook into the data mapping folder, and then manually add the source and target paths into the data reference sheet. But one thing to keep in mind, if you've made changes to the source and target schemas, for example, if domains have changed, and you need to update the workbooks, this may require additional manual updates to the workbooks. So once I've updated my workspace with the missing workbook and references, a first query is needed for loading all the inlets that need to go into the stormwater device layer. Next, I'll need to use the reverse query to load the inlets that need to be added to the structure junction layer. It's important to remember here that multiple queries may be required so that you can distribute your source data into separate targets accordingly. Now, let's start mapping our inlet assets into the Structure Junction's target layer. I can click on the Mapping Workbook link to quickly open it. The mapping sheet is active. The sheets are color-coded based on their functionality. The green tab is the mapping sheet, which is used as a reference for field mappings. This is where existing source fields need to be matched with the target fields. The yellow sheets contain information about the source and target schema. These are not designed to be edited. The target schema and source schema sheets are always generated. If your source or target datasets contain subtypes, additional source subtypes and target subtype sheets will be generated. In the source schema sheet, you will find the results for the calculate feature count statistics setting, which you've enabled when running the create data workspace geoprocessing tool. You can now see which field have values and their fill factor based on the total number of records. For example, the field facility ID in my source data has values for 4,604 records out of 4,696 records with a fill factor of 98%. So despite some records not having a value for this field, it seems that this field should be mapped. Defining a fill factor threshold for deciding on mapping a field or not is at your discretion. Finally, the blue sheets are generated for each source field that has an assigned domain. So now I'll start filling out the columns in the mapping sheet based on the matching fields from the source schema. The target field column lists all the fields from the target data set along with their field type in the second column, field type. So these first two columns have to do with the target data model. So the expression column will be automatically set with the matching target field if the source field and the target field have identical matching names, field types, and domains if present. The expression column in the workbook is the expression parameter, which is used in the calculate field geoprocessing tool. You can use it to directly map fields by selecting a field from the drop-down menu or type in a value or reference of Python expression. The expression column only allows for a single line of code, and you will need to use Python functions for multi-line expressions. 
The lookup columns are used for mapping fields with domains. Both the lookup sheet and the lookup keys define the information from the source domains. The lookup value should provide the column name with the matching target coded values from the target domain. In the mapping sheet, you will notice some conditional formatting has been configured in these Excel workbooks to help you through your mapping process and prevent invalid entries. For example, I am only allowed to enter a value for the expression column or all of the three lookup columns. If I provide a value in only one of the three lookup columns, the cells are outlined in red to indicate an incomplete mapping. If I provide an expression and lookup information, a red fill appears to indicate invalid mapping. I will start mapping all my fields without domains using the expression column. For example, asset ID should get its values from the source field facility ID. I can also set a hard-coded value. For example, in the inlet to structure junction sheet, I know all of these inlets will become manholes, and the source definition query was defined accordingly in the data reference workbook. So I can set the asset group field value to 208 for the sewer storm vault subtype in my target data model. For the global ID field, a create grid expression is used to generate new IDs for the records as they are loaded into the target geodatabase. This expression will reference the function found in the Python files found in the scripts folder. These functions are loaded when executing the data load. Now, some of my fields have domains assigned, and the coded values for my source and target datasets are different. I will need to take the time to match each field with its domain and each source domain code to its related target code. To do this, I can use the lookup columns. The lookup sheet is where you specify a source domain sheet, the blue tabs. In the lookup keys column, specify one or more columns from the domain sheet defined in the lookup sheet. For example, the lookup key here would be the column with all the codes for my coded value domain. To use multiple columns, separate them with commas. Finally, the lookup value should provide the column name with the matching target coded values from the target domain. Starting with the asset type field, I set the lookup sheet to inlet type, which corresponds to the source domain sheet. In the lookup sheet, the value inlet type is a lookup key. And you will notice the lookup value is not available yet from the lookup sheet. I can add new columns, new asset type, and description, and type in the value for my new asset type, which I can find from the target subtypes sheet. I will use the code 21 with the description catch basin. I will need to provide values for the other inlet types. Since, as you may remember, we have set a SQL query in the data reference workbook for these to be loaded into the stormwater device target layer instead. I will follow similar steps for my other fields which have domains, such as a target field material, which should get its values from the source field access map. The target field life cycle status should get its values from the source field active flag, where false is out of service and true is in service, and so on, until all the essential source fields and domain values have been properly mapped to their target in this workbook. So now I'll save this workbook and open the inlet stormwater device workbook to complete the mapping of my inlets into the stormwater device layer. I can match the fields, set the asset group to the value 28, and use the lookup columns to map the inlets to the coded value 0 for unknown, since none of the inlet types from my source data model appear to match any of the target types. This means my organization may need to collect information about those inlets during a future field inspection. So once I'm done mapping my inlets, 
I can run the execute data load geoprocessing tool to view the results of my data transformation. This allows me to review my data in the target geodatabase and then make adjustments in the data mapping workbooks before running execute data load again. Once I'm happy with the resulting data load in my target geodatabase, I can set the column enabled to false in the data reference sheet for the inlets rows and set the next row to true to continue mapping another series of assets. Finally, when I will have completed mapping all my source data into my target, I can run the execute data load geoprocessing tool against all my mapping workbooks, and my data will be successfully loaded into my target geodatabase using the new data model. So now you know how to prepare your own data loading workspace if you have multiple data sets that you need to load into a new data set. You've learned how to use the mapping workbooks and SQL queries to define how your data should be transformed from your source to target data sets. This was the third video of our series on the data loading tools. Stay tuned for more. Go to our website to get the tools now and start your own data loading project. If you have any questions, Visit the GeoNet community page for resources and updates. Thank you for watching.